Welcome to the Jazz Flight Podcast. I'm your host, Daryl Scott, and together we will dive into the lives and careers of the jazz legends who have left a rhythmic imprint on the world. Be prepared to reminisce on the highs and the lows of their musical journey and the trials that sculpted their timeless musical gems. We'll preserve the legacy of these extraordinary maestros and find inspiration in the melodies of their lives. Subscribe now and never miss a beat. Now, let's get to the show. Welcome to the Jazz Flight Podcast. I am Daryl Scott. Our guest today, Meteoric Rise, just Meteoric Rise. He's got a couple of feathers in his cap, and this is the first time I've ever talked to him. Granted, he plays guitar, but he got his start. Actually, there are two things. How did our guest is Adam Hawley? Let me say that. Let, you started by like what? Leaving college, leaving high school, and going on tour with the Manhattan Transfer? How do you how do you do that? How do you how is your reputation at that age good enough to go play with the transfer? Yeah, well, it, it all goes back to, I grew up in Oregon and I started touring at a, at a young age. I started touring at, I think I was 11 or 12. Um, and back then it was, I was in a bluegrass band, believe it or not. And the bass player in that band was also taking guitar lessons with my guitar teacher. So anyways, uh, he connected us. And uh, so, yeah, so I started touring then. I had a band in high school. But to get to what you're talking about with the transfer, you know, I, I just recognized that I needed to get to a bigger scene. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're in Cleveland, great music town. But, you know, in Oregon, there wasn't a lot going on. So L.A. was a natural transition. Me being from the West Coast, it's just a two hour flight and mm-hmm. you can drive you can drive it in a day if, if necessary. So I moved to L.A. in 2002 and went to USC with, you know, the idea that I would uh, try to do something big in the industry. And um, the way that I got the gig with the transfer, I actually was finishing up my master's. And this was in 2008. It would have been, I think, April of 2008. I was finishing my master's and um, just about to start my doctorate. And I walked into school one day. And one of the uh, professors had gotten the call. His name is Pat Kelly, amazing guitar player. He's done everything in his career, TV, film, solo career, et cetera. Um, He just wasn't available, you know, that kind of wasn't on the road anymore. And so he, I literally walked into class and he said, hey, I got called for this tour. I don't know if you want to do it. I I can't do it. (laughs) And so, and I had been busy, but it was all a uh, low stakes type of things, stuff around town, weddings, uh, um, corporate gigs, church, teaching in lesson studios. So I was very busy, but it was all in town type mm-hmm. of stuff. So yeah, so to go from that, you know, playing in the club from eight to midnight for 75 bucks or something to my first show with them was at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., in front of 5,000 people with no rehearsal. So that was my first show. And, uh, yeah, so it was an incredible experience. So, yeah, I spent four years with them. uh, It would have been, I think, May, you know, April 2008. It was pretty much exactly four years, April 2008 until April 2012. And uh, and it was going fantastic. I just happened to get the call to go on tour with Jennifer Lopez, so I I left the transfer to go do that. Uh, but no, it was it was a great way to start a career for sure. So, how old are you when you start with transfer? Twenty. So this was two thousand eight. So I was I had just turned twenty three. Twenty three. You're twenty three years old, and you're getting ready to go on tour with the Manhattan Transfer at twenty seven, roughly twenty eight. I'm going to go on tour with Jennifer Lopez. How, how do you do that? What What's what's the feeling you have? Are you like, I'm so blessed? Uh, I'm in heaven. 
uh, I'm just going to do this for the rest of my life. What was that all about? Well, no, you, I feel blessed, but but at the same time, I mean, I you know, I I do feel fortunate that that's what I that was the plan. That's what I was. It wasn't like I fell into it. That was the plan was to move to L.A. and um, originally my thought was being a studio musician you know, playing on a lot of film scores and, and record dates and whatnot. Unfortunately, I was about 15, 20 years too late for that to be it to be like a full time profession. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there's still sessions, but like there was a time where you could do that all day, every day, you know, mm -hmm. and that, that had really slowed down. So then I shifted my sights. to OK, I'd like to be a guitar player to the stars. And this is before I ever thought of I had done a few demos in college of original music, but pretty much I wasn't really thinking too hard about being an artist yet. And so, you know, that was my goal was to be a guitar player to the stars and uh, transfer J-Lo, uh, I did Natalie Cole, uh, Brian McKnight, Layla Hathaway, Joss Stone, Sheila E. Um, I'm leaving a bunch out. And then a bunch, a bunch of incredible jazz artists, Brian Culbertson, Dave Cause, Gerald Albright, um, so no, I mean, it, it was just, uh, you know, I, it definitely was what I set out to do. So I feel fortunate that I was able to accomplish it for sure. Yeah. Let me just say and applaud you that that's absolutely amazing, especially the list of, of, of people that you have played with, but how did this get started? How did you go? Have you always played guitar? Have you played anything else? Have you wanted to play anything else? Well, I always wanted to play the guitar. My my parents were a little bit resistant. Um, so uh, I guess just the connotation of guitar and rock and roll or whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, my mom made a deal with, I, I, I was asking for years and years, when I say years, like from the age of five or four until, you know, seven or eight. So finally, when I was eight, she signed me up for piano lessons and made kind of an, ult uh, an ultimatum. She said, well, if you can stick with piano for a year, then, um, you know, then I'll, I'll sign it for guitar. Mm -hmm. So, and thank, thank goodness she did because piano, I play more piano than guitar, honestly, with all of the production work I do now and writing, um, the keyboard skills are, are huge. So anyways, get to, uh, piano at eight, guitar at nine, and, uh, and then a bunch, a bunch of other instruments along the way, bass, drums, trumpet. Um, but, uh, the ones I still use all the time are mm -hmm. guitar, piano, and bass. I still play a lot of those three. Uh, not so much, not so much city trumpet and drum city for but um, mm. but yeah. And then, like I said, I you know, me touring at eleven that was by chance. That was um, you know, my guitar teacher you know just recommended me to it. But um, in high school, I really deliberately set out to tour. I put a band together. And um, it was so much fun. It was a three piece. Uh, we were a tight little unit. We had a drummer. Uh, the drummer and the bass player were dating. The, the, we had a female bassist who also sang. And I played guitar and sang. And it was, that was it. It was just the three of us. We could fit our whole band in the back of my truck and drive and go do a gig. Our, the PA, the amps, the drum set, wow. all of it could fit right in the back of the truck. So it was pretty cool. And we did a lot of dates in uh, would have been 2020 to maybe 2021 or i'm sorry i'm i'm put, mixing my dates up that was a couple years ago 2001 2002 2003 we, we did a lot of touring back then all all in oregon and washington mm -hmm. and, uh, but yeah i just felt like there was something bigger out there something you know i just wanted to see if i could hack it with the best you know and move wow. to la and uh and again la is not the only you know it's a lot of man i know so many incredible musicians from ohio uh Obviously, Atlanta is a great city, New York, right. Nashville. But again, me being from the West Coast, it was kind of an obvious. Yeah. So, right. uh, yeah, I just wanted to see if I could hack it. And uh, the cool thing about L.A., a lot of the big tours originate there. There's a lot of music for TV and film. So once I started to get known as somebody that you could rely on, was a good player and responsible and whatnot, then, you know, then, um, you know, it, it's it's kind of fun the the ascent through all that too. It's like who is this guy, and then oh yeah, we want that you know. So it went from having to do like these auditions with like thirty guitar players to right. like just getting called. Like when I did Brian McKnight, it was just like hey, can you be here in three days? You know, there's no audition. Just learn the show, be here in three days. You know, so 
it's cool to, to see that, you know, kind of flip around where, um, you know, people, you know, you have a reputation already and you're just getting the calls instead of trying to, the cattle, what they, they call them cattle calls, the big auditions with 20, 30 guitar players are kind of like, it comes down to who wears the, you know, the shoes that they like or something, you know, <laughs> it, becomes, it becomes really silly, like how they decide. Um, funny, funny story. I, before I got the transfer in 2008, in 2006 or seven, I did one of these big cattle call auditions and it was for Miley Cyrus. Hannah wow. he was going by Hannah Montana back then. And, you know, we started with like 30 and it was all instruments. They were, they were putting her whole band together from scratch. And I got to the last uh, cut. I think there was three of us left and they hired the other two <laughs> and not me. Mm -hmm. and, but I, I feel fortunate in, in the end because that, you know, my path could have been so different. You know, it was great to end up with the transfer because it was, you know, jazz and, and a very versatile gig and kind of more what I was into in mm -hmm. the end. Uh, I mean, Miley Cyrus would have been a lot of fun too, but um, you know, it, not quite as related to what I'm doing now as is uh, what the transfer was. So I have two questions. I'm going to try to answer, ask them in the correct order. So you uh, mentioned that somebody called you and they said, "Can you be here in three days?" And you have to learn the show in three days. Uh, how? How? They ship you the music and you sit down and just go through the the church or whatever. <laughs> It depends. It depends on the artist. It depends on the gig. Some some gigs have charts and some don't. So you know, um, most like pop and R and B gigs don't. But there's exceptions. But then mm -hmm. like a gig like the Transfer or Natalie Cole, um, you know, like Natalie Cole. I remember going and picking up the. You know, it was kind of like a a big, uh, you know, procedure almost going up and, and picking. You know, grabbing the music and. They gave me a flash drive of the MP3s and and you know these big books of physical <laughs> charts and same with the transfer because this was before the iPad really was now I you do every pretty much everything on an iPad but mm -hmm. you know back in 2008 I don't think the iPad I don't existed. think it was out yeah it didn't exist and then in 2012 I remember I started using an iPad in 2011 but it still wasn't um, super prevalent so with Natalie I had to go pick up the physical chart Natalie Cole. But yeah, Brian McKnight, yeah, they send you, or like Josh Stone or Chili or anything like that, or J-Lo, uh, you know, Backstreet Boys. Um, they just send you the recordings and you just memorize it. And if it was a quick turnaround and there wasn't, you know, a, a bunch of rehearsals, um, I would make little cheat sheets for myself, you know, just kind of like a, a set list, but like with extra notes, like what key is the song? You know, oh, it does a verse, a chorus half verse, half chord, then it goes to the bridge, little things like that, just to kind of help. So is that, if if you're on stage doing that, is that what I see you doing is checking your cheat sheet? Well, not now. I mean, oh, okay. now, you know, I've been touring, doing, you know, I've been uh, an artist now for nine, 10 years. And um, so no, now, I mean, I, I just have the set list. I have the names of the songs. Fortunately, I can remember my own songs, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Before, you know, when I was touring with different people, yeah, I have an, I have an I iPad, you know, in, in the later years, I'd have an iPad and it would have, you know, my charts in it. But yeah, if it was a gig that wasn't a reading gig, I would have something on the ground, you know, maybe in big font and just like, uh, you know, just like I said, what key is the song in, you know, any little thing for me to remember if there was something specific and, um, you know, so yeah, that iPad is just, it's been so great. I mean people were really resistant to it you know they worry about it does the battery die what if you lose it but if you're smart like if you have your ipad backed up you never lose anything right Even if yes. you, iPad, you lose the ipad or you get it stolen you go buy another one which i understand that's not like that's you know it's a chunk of money so i'm not trying to trivialize that but you go buy another ipad download it from the cloud you have everything you have whereas physical charts if you lose those they're gone and oh, all your notes right. and everything so no, the, the the power of the technology, if you, you harness it and, and back everything up, which is important, you know, Apple, they're getting all my money. I have, a, I have an iCloud account and a Dropbox account, all of that. But man, <laughs> it's worth it because everything's backed up. You, you, don't, you don't have those issues. You right. Know? So. so before I forget this question, who were your guitar influences while you were growing up? 
Well, I was into everything, uh, you know, for my career now, it's def, you know, for contemporary jazz, it's, it's a hundred percent, you know, George Benson and, uh, you know, I was into West Montgomery. Uh, so those are the biggest ones, but, you know, I was into a lot of different styles. So I, I was really into the blues, BB King, Albert King, Freddie King, Clapton, Hendrix, Steve Ray Vaughan, uh, some of the fusion guys, Robin Ford, especially was a big influence on me. Um, and then for rhythm guitar, I, you know, especially, I mean, I still use those skills now playing rhythm on, on the tracks I'm producing, but also, you know, when I was touring with different artists, um, so, you know, studying the rhythm guitar of, you know, Paul Jackson Jr. and, uh, Al McKay from Earth, Wind & Fire and, uh, you know, uh, Michael Thompson is a big studio guy here in LA. Um, so yeah, I really, you know, went through the gamut and, and studied a lot of these a lot of these incredible players i i know and don't get me wrong i I understand everybody that you've played with that's an incredible resume it it just is and and i don't know why one of the questions i have on here is you you played with i gotta find it um but all these people you played with why do you think they called you is it because of your resume is it because of your your respect of the music is it because of your playing why why is Lopez calling you? Why is Natalie Cole calling you? Yeah, I mean, well, kind of, you know, to echo kind of what I was saying earlier, you know, part of it is your, I mean, so if it's an audition and you don't know who you are, then yeah, it's basically just your playing and your look, you know, uh, maybe your look, depending on the gig. Uh, but then later on, as I became more established, yeah, I just, it's kind of funny. It's actually kind of simple to be, successful as long as you have the talent i mean that's easier Mm -hmm. said than done like you got to have but there's a lot of talented people really actually where where people struggle is what to me is like the simpler things like showing up on time being prepared um being just a cool guy just somebody that Mm -hmm. you know what especially when you're on longer tours you're living with people more than you're living with your own family so just being somebody who's just laid back and roll with the punches deal with the crazy travel deal with stressful situations and just you know flow through that um uh yeah like i said being able to to learn the material um i mean the other big thing is i always say consider your audience now for me that means the literal audience Mm-hmm. But when you're, uh, you know, in my previous career playing for different people, your audience is more so the artists. Like, right. what is it that they, what is real to them? And it's every situation is different. Some of them want you to play literally what is either on the page or on the recording. And if mm-hmm. you do that, you're amazing. And they, they're so grateful for it because that's not the easiest thing to do, to, right. to literally play whatever the guitar part is or what's written. Not everybody can do that. But then other people, they don't want that at all. They want you to take their music and flip it and go somewhere with it and be spontaneous and kind of be able to like make it into something else. Um, And that's what they value. That's what's real to them. And if you're not able to do that, then you're not what they're looking for. And then there's everywhere in between. Some people want a little bit of that. Some people want a lot of that. So... And then little things like I, the joke I always tell the one of the funniest experiences to me was um, as a guitar player, most artists want you to come forward. Like if you have a guitar solo, they want you to come forward, kind of rock out, really own the stage for that mm-hmm. moment. It might only be 10 seconds or it might, might maybe longer, but, you know, it's kind of like a, a they want you to really command that moment from the right. audience perspective but also it's a break for them they can turn around right. and yeah. towel off or whatever take get a drink of water so within a span of one month uh one show i was with sheila e i had it was so short it was like an eight bar solo it might have been eight seconds wow. i didn't come forward and and this is during the show we didn't have a rehearsal so i, I didn't know to do that and she turns at me, glares, yell, hey, takes her stick and goes, you know, flings it like as if, you know, you need to go to the front of the stage. Right. And so, and then like a month later, I was out with Layla Hathaway and I was doing the normal thing. When there was a guitar solo, I would come forward and play and then go back to my station. 
she came up to me after the show. Don't you think it's a bit much you coming yeah. forward? And so it was literally <laughs> like what what was what I got yelled at for not doing was right. Sheila with Layla. I got pulled aside and was like, can you please not do that? You know, so, you know, uh, some of it's instinctual. Sometimes you ask. Right. But that's a tricky thing, too. Sometimes by asking, you come across as unconfident or unsure. So, right. you know, the that was the challenge, the fun challenge. And yet I don't miss it anymore. You know, the last thing I did was five years ago. I, I was uh, filling in with Brian McKnight and I did maybe 15 shows with him or something. That was early 2019. And uh it's a fun challenge to try to be all you can be and be everything to everyone. Right. And then at the same time, I, I also don't miss it, you know, because it's, it. uh, everyone, everyone wants something different. Right. And, um, you know, I, I mean, if you can look at it and smile and just be all right, sure. You know, right. But yeah. sure, you're like, come on, like, what, you know, what, what, what are you looking for? So, uh, you know, but no, it was, it was a fun experience for sure. So before we continue, I want to give the folks an opportunity to hear one of your best songs, one of your greatest songs, one of the hottest songs out right now. And it has nothing to do with Train and it has nothing to do with 1206. And if you know the movie I'm talking about, and I think you do, it's unstoppable. It's not the Denzel Washington movie. This is <laughs> this is Adam Hawley's latest single. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Unstoppable on the Jazz Flight Podcast. That is unstoppable from our guest today on the Jazz Flight Podcast, Mr. Adam Hawley. Adam, so you've you've made the switch. You've gone from being that that I'll say sidekick, you know, member of the band, to being in front of the band. So the first question I will ask you, going back to that a bit, what is do you allow your artist, your soloist to come forward and, and kind of take the stage for a minute and have their shine, so to speak? Of course. And actually, that's a compliment I get from from <coughs> from uh, the audience, especially, you know, hanging out after the show, uh, hanging out at the CD table. Um, a lot of them will come to me, man, I love, you know, you, you really feature everybody in the show. And yeah, I mean, you know, I've got incredible musicians I'm fortunate enough to tour with. Um, one guy that's doing a lot of my shows, his name is Jason Jackson. He's an incredible saxophonist that's also signed to my record label. And um, so he's doing a lot of my East Coast shows and Midwest shows. And um, man, great player. So yeah, no, it's great. It gives me a chance to, as a guitar player, I'm always looking for an opportunity to tune. So it mm -hmm. gives me a chance to tune my guitar and, uh, you know, towel off a little bit. And uh, yeah, I, I, I love it when they uh, carry the load for a little bit. And um, yeah, so there's always a couple, you know, drum solo moments. Uh, the sax chair always gets a lot of love. Uh, but yeah, I make sure to feature the keyboardist, feature the uh, bassist. And then my wife tours with me as well, too. So she's featured. And um, yeah, I don't I don't look at it like I'm getting less of the shine. It's like, no, we're, we're all in this together. Let's put on a great show. So that, that's the, the name of the game. I have done some research on, on what you do and everything. And you just mentioned that you now have a record label. So add in, if you're, if I'm wrong, you have your solo career. Um, you have the tour where people are calling you, you are producing, I don't know how many albums at once. Um, you do a lot of things. When do you have time to do anything else? When do you have time to 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 watch the sun play basketball in other cities? But well, that's a whole nother story. But yes, we'll get to that. So how do you just how do you what's your time management like? Well, well, uh, mostly I get up early and that's the main thing. I, I prefer to do, you know, what I call business hours as opposed to like the, the uh, stereotypical musician hours. So like mm -hmm. today I got up at six um and i was working on uh working on finishing a mix for a, i can't really announce it yet but it's Not very a problem. project coming out in september but um 
Yeah, that, that's the main thing is just getting up early and putting in the hours every day. You'd be surprised like if you put in 10, 12 hours every day, year over year, um, it adds up, you know. Oh, yeah. So that's it for me. It's not so much like I don't really look at like uh, I have such a virtuosity. It's just more so just um, putting in the time and just not settling, you know, for things that are, you know, that are mediocre, whether that be if I'm just trying to record a solo. So no, just keep recording until you get it right. Or, you know, I always tell people too, getting into writing and, and music production, like every song is not a hit song. Like it, it, sometimes you write to write and that's, it's practice. And that, mm -hmm. that song might not end up and end, end up on a project. That's okay. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's just like every lick that you practice, every scale that you practice isn't necessarily part of a concert. You know, sometimes you have to do it just to, to get better at it. So that's the main thing. And with writing and production, I just do a ton of writing and, you know, always setting songs aside, you know, um, and just having them ready for the next project. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, you said it though, time management. I mean, that's the key word is, is just managing the time. Just, you know, I, but that's the main thing I think getting up early and, and just doing it. I mean, there's rarely a day that I'm just sitting around, you know, that's so, that's so unusual you know um so yeah just just putting in the time i i have questions for the third show that we'll do okay uh, <laughs> but but this is it's got to be a little tough but you're very good at what you do when in talking to tom brown he's like yeah i got this new single out and and you know adam holly's going to produce it and, and i go back to my old days where oh so you're flying to him he's flying to you and I, Tom's a charter pilot. I said, so, so when you got two week break, you're going to get out and go, no, I just send it to him and I let him do his thing. There's a level of respect that these people have for you. How do you, how do you create that respect? What is, what is it that you do that once again, makes them want to call you to produce their record? Cause producing their records a little different than you playing a guitar solo on Tom, Tom Brown's record. Yeah, well, and that's it's actually very similar to my uh, journey, you know, that we were talking about before uh, being on these big tours. Now being a producer is actually very similar. Like early on, you know, you tell people, hey, I've got tracks. I'd love to do something for you, uh, you know, but that's a very common thing. So the typical reaction, oh, sure. OK, yeah. What, you know, but so you so the thing that was the breakthrough for me was producing myself. Mm -hmm. my first album came out in 2016 and um every song uh three singles came out um two of them were number one and the one that didn't go number one peaked at number two and then my second album came out and same thing had two number ones so i had four number ones in my first two albums and but then you know seven singles total and they all went top five i think or top ten so people started calling, you know, because it's because I, I started to have a lot of impact at radio and I was I was touring as well. And so, you know, when people see success, they, they want to figure out, well, who's behind it? So a lot of people called not realizing I was the one that produced the songs and, and wrote or mostly wrote on my own. And, and a few of them were co-writes. But but I produced everything. So when I would tell people that, like, oh, wow, OK well, can you do that for me? And so it really started, It's it, and it still is word of mouth and very grassroots. Like I don't take out advertisements. I don't really um, campaign. It's very mm -hmm. rare that I'll mention to somebody, hey, let me do a track for you. Um, it's, it's just more so just word of mouth and then people seeing my, you know, seeing my songs on the radio. And, uh, and now I have kind of a sound, you know, a lot of people say they, they can tell I did the track, even if I'm not the artist, right. which is cool. So, um, so yeah, so no, I, I just feel really fortunate. I mean, what's really cool is that if I'm not on the road, I'm in front of my computer working on music. And often on the road, I'm in front of my computer working on music because I my main computer is a laptop for that reason. And, um, but yeah, Tom, you know, I, I don't know exactly why Tom reached out. I mean, you know, we've seen each other a handful of times at, at different events and uh, maybe somebody recommended me to him. I mean, we're aware of each other. You know, we've known each other for a couple of years now. 
and uh yeah he just reached out um it was very recently like two months ago he just said hey i want you to do a single for me so i sent him a bunch of tracks and then he picked the one that he really liked and it went really fast i mean he sent me some trumpets i asked for a couple overdubs and then i finished the track and and that was it you know so that's how a lot of the projects come together and um most of them are virtual like that where we're sending files back and forth mm -hmm. um and there's a there's a handful of people that come over but it's kind of more so just convenience they live in la so they right. just come over but 99 percent of the projects i do are we're sending files back and forth and even most of the artists that live in the same town as me you know live in la even them we're sending files back it's like why mm -hmm. get on the freeway and sit in traffic you know right um so but uh but yeah you know fortunately you know like i said i mean all told i have 16 billboard number ones and 40 uh 40 that have hit the top 30 on billboard so so that's part of it too is just over time just people you know they, they see the body of work and oh man you know can you do something for me and you know and we just kind of go from there is there do you put pressure on yourself to maintain you know the 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 number one hits the number the top 10 hits the top four whatever do you should the should this new project be as good as the previous one or should that one be better well what, ideally what, the music is getting better right. yeah <laughs> and i and i believe that i will be, i firmly believe every project of mine that's come out has been better than the one before but also different like i don't i don't want to look at past success and say okay let me do something similar to that it's like no always pushing for new melodies new sounds um you know uh it's like no we did that before let's do something different you know like my fourth album um had a lot of horns on it so like my more my new one I didn't do quite as much, you know, just, just little things, you know, I had a lot of features on a lot of my records. So this record, I didn't do nearly as many. It's a lot more guitar playing. It's a lot mm -hmm. more me. So then maybe my next one will, you know, swing back the other way, you know, just, just trying to mix it up. And same thing with the artists I'm working with. That's what's so much fun about having a label. And one of the reasons I started it is I'm really passionate about what I've done with my own career is over six albums really, stretch and reach and look to do some different things and um i wanted to be able to do that with with the artists i was producing because mm -hmm. a lot of people reach out and they they want one hit song from me and that's fine i'm i'm more than happy to do that but it's also fun to look at hey let's look at your whole project what like right. what song go into a 10 song project and then furthermore okay we did an album now how, where how are we going to grow in album number two and album number three so that's what's been so much fun with jason um you know with jason jackson we're working on his third album which is certainly the best of the three that we've done and then the other artists on my label um were earlier in the process um great saxophonist fabian chavez he's having a lot of success with his debut single so we're mm -hmm. early with him we're now working on the rest of his album. And then when we finish that, then we can, you know, look at what's going to happen on, on album number two and so on, you know, and, and uh, another great artist, uh, Brandon Marcel, I've done three songs for him. So same thing, everyone else, we're kind of in that early process. And it's fun because like, certainly you want to have an impact at radio, but then also you want to be able to have some variety on the project. And maybe you have a couple ballads or you have a vocal tune or you have, something more creative and upbeat or fusiony, you know, stuff that isn't, mm -hmm. isn't designed for radio. Um, and that's okay. It's kind of a different vibe. And, uh, and it's, you know, a lot of times those tunes are really fun to play live. Mm -hmm. and a lot of people, a lot of my fans come up to me and they tell me, Oh man, I really dug track nine on your third album. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a deep cut. Wasn't, meant for radio i specifically was like no let me just do something completely different just to mix right. it up mm -hmm. and uh so i enjoy doing that on my records and enjoy doing it with the artists i'm working with all right excellent let's play one more track um that you've done it's called rising up on the jazz flight podcast with our guest adam holler
rising up from uh, our guest today on the Jazz Fight Podcast, Mr. Adam Holloway. Adam, when, when, I'm very much a time management kind of person, and I know all the things you do, and at, at some point we're also going to talk to the wife, so this becomes a greater project, so to speak, of, of time management. And, and she told me you all have a son who's a basketball player. I'm just going to ask this general question. And then I'm going to ask it of her. And then when, we, when the two, three of us talk, I want to get the truth. Who's a bigger basketball fan, you or her? Oh, certainly me. But, you know, but she, you know, she's so supportive and, you know, sign, getting him signed up in this AAU league and then switching him to a different AAU league and getting all of his schedule organized, all of his, um, you know, little, uh, devices he needs treatment you know taking him to recovery all of those things so no she's incredibly supportive but like an actual fan of the game you know definitely me i mean me and my son we have the nba league pass we watch as many games as humanly possible we went to the summer league in vegas we were watching that we were watching it on tv which is if you're not any of those uh listening that aren't familiar it's 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 based this is how nerdy we are it's the rookies and or People Second that haven't players. caught on, yeah, right. they haven't caught on to a roster yet, and they're trying to fight for a spot. Yeah, so we're even watching that, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're big ball, and then we're really gotten into the WNBA this year. We're really been enjoying that. So, yeah, we're we're big time, you know, uh, basketball okay. fans. Most mostly pro. We don't watch. We'll watch college when it gets to the uh, tournament, but um, but yeah, regular season, preseason, summer league, NBA. It's just nonstop. You are one that that that's funny. We'll have to share some other stories about basketball. Um, what's up next for you? I mean, you got a whole lot going on, but I know we talked about the Tom Brown single, but what else do you have going on, or what's upcoming? Yeah, so I have a single coming out August seventh. Uh, very or no, August fifth. Excuse me. Very excited about that. It's called Fly By, and it's a little different for me. It's upbeat, which many of my tracks are, but it's more of a Latin vibe, which I've never released a single that had a little bit more of a kind of a Latin flair to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so very excited about that track. I'm already playing it live, and uh, it's been a big hit live. People really dig the tune. So excited for it to go to radio um and yeah you know a lot of music coming out for the artists on my label jason uh who i already mentioned his next single comes out in september and then his full third album comes out in october um i've got a single coming for an incredible keyboardist who's on my label mark harris he tours with naji and uh so his debut single on my label is coming out in october so excited about that and then a ton of tour dates, you know, we've got this weekend, we've got Buffalo and Baltimore. Um, I mean, I can't even keep track of them all. We're, we're all over. We might have another 20 before the Christmas tour. And then once I get into November and December, um, I fly to Nashville, do a week of rehearsals. And then I'm one of the artists on the Dave Cause Christmas tour, which this year features uh, John Butler, um, Vincent and Gala, Rebecca Jade, and myself. So there's five artists on the tour. And uh, obviously, you know, we'll do our own material, but we'll uh, mostly collaborate with each other and, you know, do group songs and appear on each other's songs. And I'm really excited about that. So that's a 20 city tour through late November and uh, early December. And with rehearsals, I end up being out for, I think, five weeks or so. Um, and then I have maybe two weeks off, three weeks off, and then right back to it in the uh, late January of 25, um, right back on the road. So, yeah. So, you know, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's, it's incredible. I don't, it's tough for me. I was a, I, I'm a workaholic. I'll tell you that right now. So working 10, 12 hours, never taking vacation, never doing any of that stuff. That, that was me. But I still do not understand how you all do it. I, I just don't because you're on a plane, you're in different cities, you're, you're, you see these people, you see those people. It, it, it's amazing. I, I applaud you uh, a, a great deal. Um, I, we talked about that Dave Cos Christmas show. It's in Cleveland, folks. Yeah. Look for it. Get your tickets. You get to see him. We had Rebecca Jade on the show. You'll get to see Rebecca. 
and I think there might be is I'll say it this way is the roommate coming along no so this is the first oh. she's getting her my wife is getting her first break in the last time she wasn't on the road with me was um I did a Christmas tour in 2022 let's see this is 24 so yeah 2022, I did a Christmas tour. It was me, Mindy, A Bear, Vincent Agala, and Lindsay Webster. So I was out for about a month. And so she had that month off. So that's the last I think she's looking forward to it. She hasn't had a <laughs> he hasn't had any time off in about two years. Cause last December I did my own Christmas tour. Mm -hmm. So we were out all of December and um she let me hear it. She's like, this, this is kind of a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so um this year, me, uh, you know, packaging up with the other cats, uh, she'll she'll get a month off, five weeks off or so, and uh, so yeah, I think she's looking forward to it. <laughs> All right, Adam, I greatly appreciate this. This was fun. I've learned an awful lot. Whatever you have that you want to put out there, uh, please let us know. Uh, we will do our part to put it on social media and play it wherever we can. There, there are secrets going on that I'm not at liberty to say right now, but um, we'll need more of you probably beginning in September. That's all I'll say. Adam Hawley, absolute pleasure. Dude, you're a good dude. I, and and I, I appreciate the time because, you know, in this conversation, I still don't understand how you have time to, you know, <laughs> to sit in your studio and, and do all kinds of records. So once again, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. We will talk to you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to the Jazz Flight Podcast. I'm Daryl Scott. We will talk to you next week. Thank you for tuning in to the Jazz Flight Podcast. I hope you enjoy the stories and soulful melodies that grew through the doors of time. If you want to stay connected with the latest updates and episodes, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell. Until next time, I'm Daryl Scott.